Okay, looks like we are ready to go. So we'll get started. You can see on my screen here that I have a picture of Sanaviv. And the weather is absolutely incredible here right now. Finally, it's uh, 90 degrees or 30 degrees Celsius, however you want to look at it. Uh, but it's all just absolutely beautiful. My name is Karen Langston. I am the Director of uh, Nutrition Research and Education here. I am also a holistic nutritionist and I am a lifestyle educator as well. And I'm also a live cell microscopist, which is something that we do here at Son of Eve. And I'm also on the Board of Director for the National Association of Nutrition Professionals. And I also do uh, program development with the help of uh, other Sanaviv team members. And we've developed a course called the Certified Nutrition Advisors course. And you can see there on the, um, on the screen there that uh, those are some of our past uh, Certified Nutrition Advisors. Uh, we have a lot of fun. So if it's something that you've been thinking about, please come down. Uh, it's open to anybody. Oh, and this is what you're seeing here is just a little bit more of um, Sanaviv. We have um, lots of programs here. We have lots of cooking classes. And uh, you can see on the right of your screen there, that is our kitchen. And that's some of our chefs there. And the one waving, that's uh, Ismail. He's our uh, one of our head chefs. And we make absolutely incredible food here, uh, five-star quality, and um, tastes like five-star quality as well. And on the left-hand side, you can see uh, two guys there hugging. That's uh, Dr. De Hoyos. He's our, our evening doctor. And you can see that we have tons and tons of fun here. And that is Jose, our uh, receptionist. Uh, one of our receptionists. Our other one is uh, Joel. So that's just a little bit of Son of Eve for you. And uh, we also have uh, tons of programs here. And we have... Um, we have classes throughout the day from all the different departments and we also do hands-on cooking type classes which you can see there as well. Uh, the best thing about Sanaviv is um, just all of the different uh, things that we have to offer here. We have um, so much technology down here that you definitely have to come down and if you're not sure uh, Sanaviv is actually located in Mexico. It's uh, uh, in the wonderful town of Rosarito, on the Baja, California, in Mexico. And it's absolutely phenomenal. And of course, Sanaviv, if you don't know, is Dr. Wentz's passion in uh, life, along with his USANA Health Sciences. And he created Sanaviv Medical Institute for people of all ages to come and get healthy. And he's, inc he's an incredible visionary, and he manifests those visions so others can share in them. And as you can see from his quote here, I dream of a world free from pain and suffering, and I dream of a world free from disease. Share my vision love life, and live it to its fullest in happiness and health. And that's basically what Sanaviv is all about. So I equate, uh, you can see here there's some more pictures of Sanaviv. Um, it's literally overlooking the ocean, and it's phenomenal. We have uh, lots of pools here, and every single one of them are uh, fresh water as well, or, or salt water, I should say. Uh, we use a filtration system, so there's no chemicals used in our pools, and there's no chemicals used on our grass as well. So let's talk a little bit about Sanaviv. Basically, uh, I equate Sanaviv to something like a house. Uh, and just bear with me, but we'll go through it. We have the uh, nutrition department, which is like the foundation um, of, of a house, and it's um, a solid foundation. And then we have the chiropractic department, which is kind of like the um, outside of the house, the solid part of the house, if you will. So um, if you don't have a strong foundation, on the outside, then the house would become imbalanced and wouldn't be able to uh, stay in proper alignment. We also have the medical team. And the medical team is basically 
uh, like the contractors and the builders of the house, you know, checking to make sure that um, all the walls and the insulation and the pipes are in proper order. And if they find something wrong, uh, then they're able to go in and tell the right contractors what to do to change it. And we also have the uh, dental department making sure that there's no toxic chemicals that can seep into the structure of the home and making sure that the windows and doors are tight for the um, overall safety and sound structure of the home. And then we have the fitness department uh, making sure that there's a good energy flow within the house and keeping the integrity in the structure. And then we have the spa and the spa is, is like maintenance of the interior and exterior that keeps everything looking great by providing a soothing environment with breathtaking views. And then we have uh, energy medicine, which is like making sure everything in the attic is flowing freely so that the structure inside and outside the house stays solid and stable. And that's basically what Sanaviv is all about. You definitely have to come down and experience it. So today we're going to be talking about leaky gut and food allergies. So leaky gut and food allergies, uh, but before we go into that, I want you to fully understand how digestion works because this is where it all starts. Any illness or disease or symptoms will be related to the underlying cause of leaky gut. So uh, basically digestion begins in the brain. And the brain will then send a message to your mouth, and it'll start producing tons of saliva, but two of the ones that are quite important are lingual lipase, which will help start the digestion of fat, and then you have the breakdown of carbohydrates with the help of the enzyme amylase. And while all that's going on, your brain is also sending a message to your stomach to activate the production of hydrochloric acid. And of course, you're going to... Um, you're going to chew your food in your mouth, so as soon as you bring it in, you're going to chew and you're going to chew. And this is one of the questions that I do ask down here of anybody that I'm presenting to, and I get quite a mix on them, but basically it should be anywhere between 25 and 50 times. And the reason for that is, is because you want to make sure that your food is being broken down, but it's also mixing with the saliva as well as mixing with the enzymes that we just talked about. And then once it's all nice and masticated and it's almost like a pureed soup or actual liquid in your mouth, you're then going to swallow that food, which now becomes medically known as bolus. That's B-O-L-U-S, and you can see that on the right. And once it, the bolus leaves the mouth, it's going to travel down the esophageal uh, sphincter, or the esophagus through uh, muscular contractions of the digestive tract. So we're going to have a, a type of peristalsis going on. So it's pushing that food along the esophagus. And when it gets to the bottom, it's going to go through a one-way flap called the esophageal sphincter. Once it's in the stomach, food enters your stomach. And your stomach should be extremely acidic. It should be a highly acidic environment. And what stops the, stom the stomach from being um, from the acid actually hurting the stomach is it's going to produce mucus. And so that music, mucus creates a coating on the outside of the stomach. And then this is where you'll begin the initial breakdown of protein. And there's a little bit of digestion of fats going on as well. And anybody who takes B, vitamin B12 or if you take iron, this is where you begin the digestive process for vitamin B12 and iron and basically what happens is, is as your stomach is churning the food around and breaking it apart it will actually break the B12 apart and then attach a, a molecule to it and the same for the iron but B12 in particular is what is called intrinsic factor so that molecule has to be attached to the B12 in order for it to be digested later in the small intestines. So in order for the uh, food to get into your stomach, it has to come through that lower, lower esophageal sphincter. And at this point, your bolus has now been all broken apart, and it now becomes known as chyme. Another reason why we need high hydrochloric acid is to keep potential bacteria and viruses and antigens from making us sick. So we can breathe in bacteria or viruses. It could be in our food, it could be in our drink, it could be on our hands. And if you have really good hydrochloric acid, 
if it's able to make it past your nose hairs or, for, or make it past your tonsils at the back of your throat, and it does make it into the stomach, it should literally be burnt up. Those bacteria and viruses should never make it past the stomach. That's another reason why we need very good hydrochloric acid in our stomachs. So once your uh, chyme leaves the stomach, it's going to go into the small intestines, and there's three parts to the small intestines. There's the duodenum or the duodenum, depending on what part of the country you're from, the jejunum, and the ileum. And the small intestines are all about absorption, especially the ileum and the jejunum. Those are the ones that are going to be doing most of the absorption. And what you're going to be absorbing is just about everything. You're going to be absorbing all of your vitamins and your minerals and your essential fatty acids, your antioxidants, your electrolytes, uh, even the chemicals from your, your food will also be digested in the small intestines. Now the first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum and I like to refer to this as the hot spot or party central because this is where all of the final breakdown is being done before the food is then going to go into the uh, jejunum and the ileum. So basically you have your liver and your gallbladder and you have your pancreas and your stomach and that's the, just part of the duodenum that you're seeing there. So just to break it down so that you can completely understand is you have your gallbladder, and that's a little green, uh, small cucumber looking on the left-hand side, and it stores bile that's been made in your liver. Now remember I said that when your food or your bolus or your chyme actually comes through the stomach, it's going to be highly, highly acidic. So when it goes into the duodenum, we don't want it to be highly acidic because it will burn the small intestines. So your gallbladder will release baking soda or known as bicarbonate. We have our own baking soda and what it does is it changes the pH of that chyme. Your gallbladder is also going to release bile salts and it's going to release bile which is going to emulsify fats and all that means is it's going to take large fat particles and make them smaller so that they can be absorbed in the other part of the small intestines. This is also where you will do the breakdown of vitamins K, E, A, and D. And while that's going on, you then have the pancreas, which is just sitting there underneath the stomach, and it's releasing enzymes, and we're going to break down uh, our protein into amino acids, and amino acids are used for every function in the body, and it's also going to release uh, uh, enzymes to break down carbohydrates. So the duodenum is the party spot, it's party central, it's the hot spot, it's where everything is happening. And then once we're finished with the duodenum, we are then going to go into the jejunum, which is the second part of the small intestines. And here we'll do absorption of water, sugar, fatty acids, and electrolytes. Now in order for this to happen, for the jejunum and the ileum to be able to absorb these nutrients from your food, they're going to use what are called microvilli. And microvilli are like finger-like projections, or if you remember the 70s and shag carpeting, they kind of look like shag carpeting and they sway back and forth. If you don't remember shag carpeting, just think of a bunch of flexible straws with a hole on the top and just swaying back and forth. And all they're going to do is they're just going to um, collect nutrients. All of your nutrients have broken down and they're going to go through those little tubes and they're going to go into the bloodstream and then they'll be taken up by the liver. Now remember I said that you also will be taking in all of the toxins from your food or the toxins that you breathe in or the toxins that you put on your skin. Those also will go through the microvilli and when they hit the liver, the liver will then decide what to do with them. Now most of the toxins that we're bringing in are going to be fat soluble and in, when they're in their fat soluble stage, they can actually cause a lot of harm for you. So we have what is called phase one and phase two detoxification. And it's actually quite simple. So phase one metab metabolism results in small chemical changes that make a compound more hydrophilic or water attractive so that it can be effectively eliminated by the kidneys. 
Now this is done through cytochrome P450, which is a family of about 50 different enzymes found in all of the tissues in your body with the highest concentration in the liver cells. And so basically all we're doing for phase one is we're going to take those fat soluble we're going to take those fat soluble uh, toxins and we're going to make them attractive to water so that when phase two comes in, when phase two comes in, they're going to become water soluble. And all that means is that for phase two, all that means is for phase two, that it's going to be uh, less harmful at this point so that we can easily excrete them out of the body. And the way that we're going to do that is through the gallbladder and then through bile and then into the stool. And the other way is going to be through our kidneys and then eventually through our urine. Now in order for this whole process to happen, we have to have certain nutrients. And those nutrients that you can see there, uh, phase one, we need B vitamins and folic acid, glutathione, antioxidants, milk thistle, carotenoids, and we need vitamin E and vitamin C. And for phase two, we need tons of amino acids, which would be glutamine, glycine, taurine, cysteine, sulfur, sulfurated phytochemicals. And we also need um, sulfur type foods such as garlic and onions so that we can help with glutathione um, production which is a powerful antioxidant that will help in that phase two. So for phase one and two to happen successfully the liver requires all of these nutrients and if the phase one or two detoxification pathways become overloaded there will be a buildup of toxins in your body. Now many of these toxins are fat soluble like I said and they incorporate themselves into fatty parts of your body where they may stay for years if not for a lifetime and unfortunately two of those places as well are the brain and the endocrine system, the hormonal glands um, and any type of fatty organ are common sites for fat soluble toxins to accumulate. So as long as you have the proper nutrients, you're bringing in the, the foods that can help, your liver will take care of them. It'll go through that phase one and that phase two. All right, so back to the ileum, which is the last part of the small intestines. This is where you're going to be doing your absorption of fats, bile salts, water, and electrolytes, as well as vitamin B12. This is where it will be finally absorbed. And the next part is the large intestine. Now in order to get into the large intestine we have a flap known as an ileocecal valve and before we get to that just to let you know that the large the the parts of the large intestine are your cecum, the ascending colon, the transverse colon which is going across and the descending colon which is coming down and then you have the sigmoid colon and the rectum. Now at this point basically what happens is that we have only um, undigested particles left. So what we have is water. We have water in the small intestines and then we just have the leftover parts of your food that couldn't be broken down. So that would be undigested type fibers. And so we have a valve there called the ileocecal valve. And so we want to slow things down before it goes into the large intestine. If you can think of like a water park, you get onto the top of the water park, right? You get in your little uh, vessel or your tire and then you're just whoosh, all the way through. So if we didn't have that valve in place, we would basically be going to the wash washroom all of the time. And we definitely don't want that happening. So what happens is, is the, um, the uh, small intestines will have that little ileocecal valve just to slow things down. So when we get into the large intestine, this is mainly the collection of cellular and hormonal waste. So there's no absorption being done except in the cecum, the very first part of that large intestine, and there would be very little absorption of vitamin K, B1, B2, and B12. So in order for you to get your food and to the toilet, this whole entire process takes about 12 to 24 hours. It just depends on what you're eating. So in the stomach, it's about two to four hours. In the small intestines, it's about one to five hours. And then from the colon to the toilet, it's about 12 hours. So this is how digestion is supposed to work. You've, you're eating, uh, you're relaxing, you're taking your time, you're not, you're not um, 
you know, just sort of chomp, chop and swallowing. You're doing your 25 to 50 chews. And so everything is getting properly absorbed. Your microvilli are really happy. But unfortunately, most of us don't have the luxury of proper digestion. I would say it's probably about 95% of the North American population. This is more what our story looks like. You know, I call this dashboard dining. And basically, everything that you see uh, surrounding this picture will lead to what we call premature dumping of the stomach. And it starts with the fact that you see food, you immediately put it in your mouth, there's no breathing in place, there's no chewing, it's literally chomp, chomp, swallow. Half of us don't even know that we're supposed to, to chew, and so we're swallowing these large chunks. And then you combine caffeine with that. Uh, caffeine speeds up transit time, it speeds up... Uh, the whole stomach process as well. Uh, fast foods, of course, don't have any nutrients. Uh, you look at the pollution, you look at your stress. All of this is going to have uh, play a role on how well your stomach is going to digest. So you bring your food in, you go chomp, chomp, swallow. It goes down the esophagus and it hits the stomach. And guess what? You haven't mixed. You haven't spent the time in your mouth mixing your food with the enzymes that we talked about. So there's no mixture of these enzymes. And of course, your stomach isn't highly acidic because it wasn't ready for the food. And so it comes in under a low pH. So we said that the stomach has to be highly, highly acidic. So when it dumps into the duodenum, it's going to be prematurely dumping in there. But guess what? There isn't going to be any baking soda released because the food is already alkaline. So when it's alkaline, the gallbladder is not going to fire and the pancreas is not going to fire. So you will not have that emulsification of fats properly. You also won't have the breakdown of protein into um, amino acids. And so basically this food is going to go through your entire intestinal tract and it's going to be large undigested proteins. So what's going to happen is they're larger than the nutrients that would be coming in and now they've got to try and cram themselves through these little teeny tiny microvilli and what do you think is going to happen? Of course what's going to happen is they're going to start breaking down and they are going to start eroding the entire microvilli and it's going to cause cracks and fissures. Once that happens these undigested um, foreign proteins are able to come right into the bloodstream. Once that happens your liver is going to send out a private investigator. Now for some of you, you might remember Magnum PI and his red Ferrari, and some of you might not know who Magnum PI is, and so we'll stick with Google Gadget. But basically what happens is, we send out a private investigator, and he's there to investigate what is going on in the bloodstream. What are these unidentified foreign proteins in the bloodstream? So, of course, he doesn't have a clue as to what these are, so he reports back to the liver and says, you know what, you need to send out the army. So let's bring out the army. So we send in the army, and the army comes, and they're now trying to break these foreign proteins down. These are known as your white blood cells. So they've come in, and they're attacking, and they're breaking down, and what happens is it increases inflammation. It's increasing heat, and it's increasing inflammation. So what happens is your body now sends out the fire, the fire department. So the fire department comes in and what they're doing is spraying lots of water trying to put all this heat and this inflammation out. This is called a histamine response. And if any of you have ever taken antihistamines, this is basically what's going on, is we are trying to quell this whole heat. Now what we refer to this as is leaky gut. What happens is, is the intestinal wall becomes leaky and starts allowing undigested food particles to enter into your bloodstream. And eventually this will lead to your immune system coming, becoming defenseless. So basically we send out a signal for your immune system to come and investigate the foreign invaders and it sees it as a threat and so it keeps sending out all these white blood cells to attack and so this, this process is happening from not just the food that you ate right now, but every meal after that. And most of us have at least three meals a day, and so this is happening at least three times a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, and eventually 
it's going to wear down and cause your immune system to become defenseless. Defenseless. Why does this happen? Because 70 to 80 percent of our immune system and half of our nerve cells and neurotransmitters are involved in our digestive system. I call it the uh, double-edged sword. It's like your um, your your immune system is there to work for you, and so it's supposed to be in protective mode. But basically what happens is when we have this complete annihilation and breakdown of the small intestine and the microvilli, basically what happens is the immune system starts to overreact and it starts to inappropriately act and it starts attacking everything in your body. And so this is when everything can start to go downhill. And one of the two things that can happen are allergies and food sensitivities. Now, an allergy, the term allergy was coined in 1906 by an Austrian physician named uh, Perquet, and the definition of an allergy was basically an altered reaction. Any pathological response to a normally benign substance was referred to as an altered reaction or allergy. Or later, in, uh, when European allergists decided to define allergy, they changed it to a rapid reaction. Basically, um, it became a rapid response to exposure that would result in an instant reaction such as hives, sneezing, or swelling. Um, and not much has changed today. We were still using the same type of definition. So the key word here is rapid, and this is known as an IgE antibody response. Um, it's, it's a quick reacting type of response. So usually it will be your outside environmental triggers, um, you know, pollen and dust, that kind of thing in the, in the air. But sometimes foods can also be a culprit. Think about uh, anaphylactic type shocks. An allergy uses what is called the immunoglobulin E or IgE antibody, which is produced by your immune system, and it's a quick reaction, like I said. Usually it will be your outside environmental triggers, but some foods can also be a culprit. So if you're suffering with leaky gut syndrome, IgG, IgE antibody reactions can become increasingly worse, or if you did not suffer with allergies before, you could actually start to develop these types of reactions, all because of a leaky gut syndrome. So what you're seeing here is the typical um, allergy testing that's done by your doctors, and IgE antibodies are what is tested um, at the allergist's office. So although they can test for food, there's a better response to allergens in the air and in your environment. So you can get your whole back done, and that's what you're seeing here. That's actually a quarter of a panel. But they also do your arm as well. And basically what they do is they just do a very light scraping or poke of the skin, and then they'll put the suspected allergen in there. And if you have a reaction, like you can see on this uh, gentleman's back, that would mean that you would have a specific IgE reaction. Now they do test for foods as well, but the problem is is that most foods will have a delayed reaction unless there's a severe reaction to it with an IgE. So let me just explain that a little bit further to you. So food sensitivities, so we're not calling them allergies, we're calling them sensitivities and they're immunoglobulin G or IgG because they provide long-term resistance to infections and have a much longer half-life than traditional IgE allergy. So a food sensitivity is basically an adverse reaction to a food with no antigen antibody response. And this is what IgG immunoglobulin G is all about. So they're delayed, they're a delayed response, and that may come with adverse effects and sometimes vague symptoms that do not allow for any type of diagnosis. So leaky gut and digestive issues play a major role in the development of these types of food sensitivities. So again, you're seeing it here, when there's leaky gut problems, food particles are able to enter into the bloodstream, and when these particles are recognized by the immune system, the, bot or the body has an immune response which can manifest anywhere from uh, ingestion up to 72 hours later. 
So this is a food sensitivity attack. And what you're seeing there in front of you are your tight junctions and those little brushes or those little uh, finger-like projections. Those are your microvilli on top. Now, the problem is, is that food sensitivity food sensitivities have a ton of symptoms. So everything that you're seeing here can be related to food sensitivities, but they really are the underlying cause of a leaky gut. So, uh, so some of the, the more known um, symptoms are like abdominal, abdominal pain or uh, bloating or excess gas, those kinds of things. But we and diarrhea even and constipation, but we don't look at the other sensitive uh, sensitivity symptoms, which can be insomnia, uh, shortness of breath, anxiety, uh, fevers of unknown origin, even gluten intolerance. Everything that you see here can be a symptom of a food sensitivity, but it's a, it's also a sense it's also a symptom of leaky gut. So what happens is over time you have these these types of symptoms going on, sometimes for years, and so you can end up with illnesses being manifested from there, and this is not a, a complete list, but this is an example of what can happen if we don't deal with leaky gut. So you start to have diagnoses of illnesses, diseases, and cancers. And then we also have to look at food in our environment. 95% of food reactions are of the delayed type. So sensitivity reactions can be delayed or hidden and are a good indication of leaky gut syndrome. So these types of reactions often involve IgA, IgG, and IgM antibodies. And they're triggered in response to foods. They can be... Um, triggered by chemicals, chemicals in our home, chemicals in our, our uh, laundry detergent, our cleaning products, and even our personal uh, hygiene products as well. Uh, there's also a response to bacteria and toxins and molds. Now these types of foods provoke about 80% of food sensitivity reactions. And antigens, food particles enter the bloodstream through the damaged mucosal uh, membranes. So going through those damaged parts that I showed you, those damaged microvilli, and they're going to trigger an immune response and a delayed hypersensitivity response. So this leads to inflammation and cell damage and disease. And this allows for opportunistic bacteria and fungus and yeast and viruses to also make their way into the bloodstream now. Your, your first line of defense has now been completely broken down. So here's a great example. Um, once leaky gut has been established, like I said, bacteria, fungus, and yeast can, are now freely able to enter into your bloodstream, and they can travel through your blood and affect other organs and tissues, including joints in your body. So here you see on the screen is an example of a blastocystitis uh, hominis, and uh, Basically, it's a bacteria that causes uh, gastrointestinal problems and has been found in the synovial fluid in the knees of arthritis patients. So are you really suffering with arthritis, or could it actually be that you're suffering from a bacteria that's attacking your joints? And of course, there's other bacteria and funguses and yeasts and parasites that can make it in. You've got the blastocystitis hominis that I talked about. You have Gargardia. You have Heliobacter Hel Helicobacteria, which is H. pylori. You have Salmonella, uh, Shigella, Yersinia, and Entercolicitia. Ambius bass, I mean, some of these you can't even pronounce, but they are nasty bugs that you definitely don't want in your, uh, in your intestines, but you also don't want them in the blood as well. You can also have candida. Now, all of these can irritate the lining and cause gastrointestinal symptoms, as well as many other symptoms that were previously listed. So if you're dealing with uh, even inflammatory bowel disease or even IBS, is it really inflammatory bowel disease or IBS, or is there something else going on and that it's being triggered by one of these bacteria or funguses or yeast? So um, once all of this is happening, of course, it's going to affect your liver, and um, it can lead to a complete immune system breakdown that can cause overwhelmed detoxification pathways in your liver that can lead to sensitivity to new foods. 
and you can also be sensitive to the foods that you've already been consuming and this can also lead to increased sensitivities, uh, in, increased chemical sensitivities. So if you've been doing really well but you've noticed over the last couple of years that suddenly you're not able to eat the foods that you did love, you're not able to um, even any new foods that you're bringing in you seem to just react to and now you seem to have chemical sensitivities to perfumes and, and uh, strong odors. That means that your liver is now involved and I'll mention here again that the standard American diet does not allow for proper nutrients to aid in detoxification and support and so you have a complete breakdown of the liver. So we're not bringing the nutrients in but the liver is being overwhelmed because the liver's job is to take all of these toxins and to break them down into a less um, harmful form by making them more water soluble. So you end up having a gastrointestinal reaction but you also have a liver reaction as well and this causes a complete breakdown of not only the gastrointestinal system but also the immune system. So at this point you are reacting to everything but you go to the doctors and there's nothing that the doctor can do for you because there's no diagnosis at this point. Now this type of condition can go on for years before you have any type of um, diagnosis from your doctor. So now that I've scared you half to death, what can you do about it, right? Well, one of the things that we do here at Sonaviv is what we call the 4R program. So we're going to remove, replace, re-inoculate, and repair. Now what exactly does that mean? Basically what we're going to do is we're going to remove what's causing the problem. So we're going to remove a lot of the foods that are full of chemicals and we're going to remove um, any of the foods that may be causing problems for you. Now the ones that are going to be removed for sure is going to be gluten. That's number one. We're going to remove genetically modified foods and we're going to remove foods that cause histamine in the body and we're going to remove foods that cause inflammation in the body. So here at Sonaviv we use an, uh, a low ketogenic anti-inflammatory type diet. So then we're going to replace with the foods that we've removed. So what are we going to do? We're going to pump you up full of whole foods, uh, foods that are full of all of the nutrients that you need to run your body properly. And to run your body properly you need uh, amino acids from protein, you need vitamins, you need minerals, you need essential fatty acids, and we're also going to re-inoculate you. And what that means is we're going to put the good bacteria back in your system and the reason why we're going to do that is because if we can put really good bugs back into your, into your small intestines, which is basically your microflora, that's going to build up your immune system and it's actually going to fight off those opportunistic bacteria and viruses and funguses that should not be there. And how we do that? Well, yes, you can use probiotics, but you can also use fermented foods and fermented drinks. Uh, fermented foods could be kimchi or uh, cabbage. It could be pickles. Here at Sanabi, we actually have tons of kimchi and uh, red cabbage. And you can also use a fermented drink, which is called kombucha. At the same time, we are now going to put you into repair mode. All right, so we've removed, we've replaced, we're re-inoculating, so we're now repairing you by um, ramping up or bumping up your nutrient intake, so we may be adding some supplements in there, maybe some digestive enzymes. It all just depends on um, your blood work and your functional testing that comes back so we can find out what areas of the body that we need to work on. So on that note, uh, one of the things that you can do as well that we do here at Sonaviv is functional testing. Some of the functional testing that we do here, we do IgG food sensitivity panels, we use the Heidelberg gastric analysis, we do Array 2 and we do Array 3 and we do Array 4 which I'll get into and we also do a GIFX comprehensive profile here. So let's talk about the first one which is your IgG uh, food sensitivity panel. Believe it or not, this is probably the last test that I would have done. Now I know that there's a lot of naturopath naturopathic uh, doctors and nutritionists out there that do IgG food sensitivity panel, but here's why I'm thinking that you need to leave it to the, la to the, to the last. 
We spent a lot of time talking about how antigens can go into the body and we have that complete breakdown of the microvilli, right? Well, if everything's broken down, you have so many uh, bacterias and viruses coming in and you have all these unidentified uh, foreign proteins coming in. If you have an IgG food sensitivity panel done, you're probably going to come back with most of the foods causing a reaction because your whole body is in um, super inflammatory mode. So it really isn't a true indication of what you could be sensitive to. What you would need to do is uh, repair your leaky gut, uh, get those tight junctions back in, and then test for food sensitivities because then we would get a true representation of what really is a sensitivity to you. And then those foods would need to be removed or at least rotated so that they don't cause um, an inflammatory response on your small intestine. So let's talk about the Heidelberg gastric analysis. Basically, it's a test that's been used for over 30 years with more than 143 published studies. And um, it's been published at, uh, since 1977. Now, this is a 90-minute test that involves swallowing a vitamin-sized capsule. Now, that looks a little bit big there in the picture. It's probably a little bit uh, smaller, so don't panic. And um, it has a pH meter and a radio transmitter on it. And it's able to pick up on diseases that are associated with gastric acid deficiency and, and can include um, if you have a gastric uh, deficiency that can lead to uh, diseases such as asthma, diabetes, chronic hives, and a long list of other um, autoimmune diseases. So we're going to know by the end of this what your pH is like, if there's anything going on in your esophagus, and um, then we can make decisions based on what we see from that. Because like I said, you have to have high hydrochloric acid. So this is going to let us know exactly how much hydrochloric acid you have and whether, and then like I said, we will then uh, determine what to do next based on the results. Now the Array 2 uh, is known as the Intestinal Antigenic Permeability Screen. Now what permeability basically means is how much of your small intestines, including your microvilli, have been broken apart. Are there tons of holes in there? That kind of thing. So we're going to measure your intestinal permeability to large molecules to find out how much inflammation is going on and how much of your immune system is involved with this. We're also going to identify the damaging route through the intestinal barrier. So just think back to those small intestine pictures that I was showing you and that breakdown of the microvilli. So who is this good for? Well, it's definitely good for people who are presenting with multiple symptom complaints, including chronic fatigue syndrome. So if it's not just, you know, your gas, your bloating, your diarrhea, your constipation. If you remember that slide I showed you, there was probably about 30 symptoms on there. So if you have fogged brain or even your eyesight seems to be uh, going back and forth between you, you need your glasses and then you don't need your glasses, or you have reoccurring headaches or joint pain, um, just about any condition or any symptom that you can think of that you can't seem to get a straight answer for, this would be really, really helpful for you. And of course, if you have an autoimmune condition, uh, lupus, osteoarthritis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, colitis, or even the IBS, this would be a fantastic test for you to get done. So if you have any food allergies or sensitivities or intolerances going on, you know, you're bringing food in and, and you're constantly reacting no matter what you eat or drink, this is definitely a test that you want to have done. We also do the Array 3, which is known as the Wheat Gluten Proteum Reactivity and Autoimmunity. And basically, it's going to accurately identify gluten reactivity, and it measures antibody production against nine wheat proteins and peptides and three essential uh, structure enzymes. So it's not just gluten that we're looking for. We're looking for all of the components of wheat and how your body is reacting to those. So who is this one good for? It's for those who have had no uh, response to their GI symptoms. So if you've taken gluten out of your diet and you're still having gastrointestinal symptoms or you're still having joint pain or you're still even having the symptoms that you had before you went off gluten, this is definitely um, a test that you'd want to get done.
It's also good for those uh, who have complaints or multiple symptoms, including chronic fatigue syndrome or even fibromyalgia. This would definitely be a test that you'd want to get done. And anybody who's suffering from depression or neuroautoimmunity or even just feeling down or you're back and forth, your moods are all over the place, this is a great test to get done because um, research has shown that gluten can ride the same neural pathways as opiates, or even street drugs or uh, painkillers. So you could have an addiction without even knowing that you have an addiction and it could be um, one of the proteins within gluten that you're reacting to. So th that would be one of the tests that we would recommend here. Another test that we do is the Array 4, which is gluten-associated cross-reactive foods and food sensitivities. It's, going, it's uh, identifying additional dietary proteins to which the non-celiac gluten-sensitive um, or celiac disease patient is sensitized to. So this could be even for people who have already been diagnosed with celiac or those who have not been diagnosed with celiac. So you, you could have even have had the test for celiac disease, but you're still having gluten sensitivity. So this is um, something that you'd want to look into. It detects cross-reactions in the patient non-responsive on a gluten-free diet. So it's categorizing the 1 and 2 NCGS or um, CD patients who also are sensitive to dairy products. So who is this good for? This is good for those who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity or celiac disease and those who are experiencing limited improvements on a gluten-free diet and those who have gut dysbiosis, which appears to be resistant to standard therapy. It's also good for those who have taken gluten out, like I said, but they're still having reactions because this is going to test foods that can ride along those same pathways and cause much of the same symptoms as gluten symptoms. So we would test for rye and barley like you're seeing here. We'll test for spelt and polished wheat. We're going to test for cow's milk. Um, we're going to test for all of the different components of dairy. So that would be your casein, uh, your, your cas uh, casomorphin, IgG and IgA. We're going to look at whey protein as well. We're even going to test chocolate and oats and yeast, coffee, sesame, buckwheat, sorghum, everything that you're seeing here, millet, hemp, amaranth, quinoa, tapioca, teff, soy, egg, corn, rice, and potatoes. And we're going to test for those because they could be a sensitivity as well, and they're acting like a gluten reactivity, but it's actually these that are causing you to continue to have those pains or continuing to have those symptoms. So it's really, really important if you're still suffering with symptoms and you're not getting any relief to have an Array 4 done. The other thing that we do here is the GI effects, and it's a stool analysis. And basically, it's a gastrointestinal function that's important for general health. The intestinal tract contains um, significant amounts of bacteria, like I've been talking about. You have your good bacteria and your bad bacteria, uh, which, when in balance, can be associated not only with IBS and IBD, uh, which is inflammatory bowel disease, so irritable bowel syndrome and uh, Crohn's and colitis, but it can also be associated with other immune disorders, including diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So balancing gut microflora is the key for optimizing digestion and absorption of nutrients, as well as metabolic functions. Uh, and how are we going to do that? Well, basically, we are going to balance all of, or take a look at all of the types of um, bacteria that you can have in your body. And uh, it would start with what you see there, which is your anaerobes, making up over 95% of your microbiota, microbiota in the gut, and it can be identified using the GI effects. We're going to look at parasites using uh, OPR technology and um, an unlimited number of parasites can be detected. To date, we've got over 40 parasitic organisms that have been identified through the GI effects comprehensive profile. We're also going to look at the adiposity index, which measures the imbalances of the two predominant bacterial groups in the human uh, gastrointestinal tract. So you've got the bacteriodites and the firmicutes, which may have, be associated with obesity in some studies. So if you're not losing weight, it could be 
that you have um, an overgrowth of uh, these types of bacteria. We're also going to look at absorption. So um, absorption indicates issues with elevated levels of long-chain fatty acids, uh, cholesterol, or total fat, so, uh, which is the sum of all gut lipids. So if you're suffering with um, uh, you know, cholesterol issues or even triglyceride issues, you definitely would want to have this done. And of course, we're going to look at the levels of inflammation, uh, in particular uh, lactoferrin, which is a marker of gut immune function, and it's clinically utilized to identify the presences of gastrointestinal inflammation. And then, of course, we're going to look at sensitivities, uh, such as those that are found with pharmaceutical and botanical um, uh, ingredients, because those can cause a sensitivity as well. So basically what we're doing is looking at this comprehensive profile to really understand what exactly is going on in your, in your intestines. So you can spend a lot of time doing food um, diet diaries, you know, trying to take foods out. But the problem is, is that when you're dealing with food sensitivities, it can be anywhere from the onset of eating that food up to 72 hours, sometimes even up to a week. So it really, instead of guessing, why not find the right test and just really pinpoint what's going on? It kind of goes back to the whole house thing, right? You've got the medical team here who can tell you exactly what's going on so that we can then tell all the other parts, uh, other practitioners what to do in order to make you that whole person again. So instead of guessing, why not do the testing? So. This is just a very short overview of how uh, leaky gut and allergies could be um, the potential for all of the symptoms that you're dealing with. And one of the places that you can come and find out exactly what's going on is here at Sanaviv. So I thank you very much for uh, coming out to this, um, this webinar. And if there's any questions, just give me a second here. And I'll see if there's any, and then uh, I will get those answered. Let's see. Hmm. Whew. Tons and tons and tons of questions. Ha, ha, ha. Let me see if I can pop it out. Uh... Okay, let's see here. Here's one. There seems to be an epidemic of women having their gallbladder removed. What is contributing to that, and what is the best prevention? What do you recommend to them to avoid so that it doesn't happen, I'm assuming, and what do you recommend to those who have had their gallbladder taken out? Deborah, that is an excellent question, and you're right. There is an epidemic, not only of women, but men having their gallbladder removed as well. Basically, it's, it really does come down to, number one, we're not chewing our food. We are literally putting that food in our mouths and we're putting and we're doing it like a chomp swallow or a chomp chomp swallow. We're not breathing before we eat so that we can disengage our, um, immune, our central nervous system. And so we have this food coming into a stomach that has no hydrochloric acid whatsoever and it's then dumping into the duodenum where the gallbladder should be firing. So first of all, we have to start chewing. Second of all, we have to uh, make sure that we're mixing our food with our enzymes and our saliva so that when it does hit our stomach, we have good hydrochloric acid. And one of the other things that we need to do is get off of all of the um, uh, acid blockers because acid blockers, but of course, don't go off them without speaking with your doctor first. Please don't do that. But acid blockers and even over-the-counter um, antacids are decreasing hydrochloric acid. And I'm hoping that you learned in this brief webinar how important hydrochloric acid is because that's where we're going to break everything down. So as long as it's in the stomach from two to four hours, it's then going to dump into the duodenum. And basically what happens in the duodenum is what? The gallbladder is going to fire, right? It's going to fire and emulsify those fats. It's going to fire the uh, baking soda and the bile salts to change that pH. So, so those are some of the things that are contributing to this whole epidemic of um, you know, gallbladder removal. Plus, the other part of it is, too, is that if you have a stone or anything like that, um, 
uh, stuck in the in the gallbladder, nine times out of ten you go to the doctors and they just remove it because they they believe that you can live without your gallbladder. Uh, some of the problems with removing the gallbladder is number one you are now not going to have proper emulsification of fats so it's really important for you to not only be taking some form of an essential fatty acid supplement but you also want to look into pancreatic enzymes because if the gallbladder isn't firing then the pancreas isn't firing its enzymes so you're not breaking down your amino acids and amino acids are used for every function in your body we cannot live without amino acids amino acids are the building block okay and you're also probably not doing that final um, carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrate breakdown because those enzymes aren't there. So it's really important to get on some form of a pancreatic enzyme. And of course, here at Sanaviv, uh, we've got the phone number there. You can also go to our website. We have uh, doctors that can help you with that. Uh, what else can I recommend if your gallbladder is done? Chewing breathing, getting that uh, enzyme in place, and um, just really making sure that you stay on that enzyme for a lifetime. Okay, so I hope that answers your question, Deborah. Second question is, what program or package would a guest ask for at Sonaviv, which would provide the 4R program? Florence, that's a great question. You know what? Every single one of our programs, every single one of them, from our detox and rejuvenation, right down to our cancer and chronic illness programs, all do the 4R because that's the whole point of Sanaviv. The point is, is that we want to remove what's bothering you, remove what's causing the uh, dysbiosis or the imbalance in your system. And then we want to repair you, we want to re-inoculate you, and we want to revive you. The coolest thing about living, uh, living here, I live here, but the coolest thing about working at Sanaviv is I watch people come in and they have no color in their faces, they have no sparkle in their eyes, and if anything, they almost look like they have a humped back and their heads down. By day three, from just eating the food here and getting on this 4-hour program, they stand straighter, uh, they, their skin color looks amazing, the whites of their eyes become white, their eyes sparkle, and they walk around with this incredible smile on their face. I just feel so honored and blessed to be able to witness that every single day here at Sanaviv. So Florence, if you're interested, uh, you can definitely give the two phone numbers a try there, the US, USA number, or if you're outside of the United States, then you can use the Mexico International number. And we have uh, wonderful admissions and sales teams that can help you with that. Okay, so what happens, Claudia is asking what happens when the gallbladder is removed. Well, I think I answered that with the other one, um, but just basically once it's removed, you're not going to fire a proper um, uh, bile into your system. You're not going to have that, the bile salts. You're not going to have the baking soda. And there is research out there that there is a higher incidence of MS later in life if you've had your gallbladder removed. Why? Because your uh, your your nerves are surrounded by what is called the myelin sheath and the myelin sheath is made up of essential fatty acids as well as uh, vitamins B6 and B12 and some of the minerals. So it's really important that if the gallbladder is being removed, like I said, that you're on a pancreatic enzyme, that you're uh, getting lots of essential fatty acids and you're taking in really good minerals as well. Uh, Chamberlain says, fantastic, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. That was an easy one. Uh, how do you help children eat slowly? Kim, that's a great question. Well, the first thing that we can do is turn off the TV, and then we can get together as a family around the table, and let's make it a game, right? Let's just start off that this week we're all going to start with five chews. I know some of you are probably laughing, but believe it or not, some of us don't even chew five times. So you just start working up to that 25 times and uh, one of the things that we um, this is probably too much information but I'll share it with you anyway what we used to do in our household is we would play guess what so we would put the the food in our mouth and then we would just open our mouth we'd say guess what and then open our mouth and so if we could actually guess what was in the mouth then we hadn't chewed it enough <laughs> so I hope that that helps you um, okay so Linda Liu is asking what USANA products can help with leaky gut 
Uh, Hepacil would definitely help with leaky gut. I would definitely look at some fiber G as well. Uh, we want to make sure that we're bulking up our intestines and we're helping to remove the food out. And uh, digestive enzymes would definitely help as well. Uh, they would help to in, in breaking down that food. Uh, Beth says, so much great information. Will you be doing this webinar again? I don't know if I'll be doing this webinar again, but I can tell you that uh, we have the Doctors Are In tour, and I'm on tour with uh, Dr. McNamara, so you can go over to the uh, USANA website and find out where I'm speaking. I'm actually in San Diego this weekend, and then I'll be in Atlanta at the end of the week, at the end of the month with um, Dr. McNamara. And you can also uh, get a recording of this as well, and it will be, uh, if you just go to YouTube and uh, put in SANA, uh, webinars and it will come up for you so I hope that helps you Beth so um, Sim is saying how do you get the Heilberg capsule out of the system it's attached to a string so basically we just put it in and we do what was necessary and then we pull it back out uh, June is asking can the diagnostics be done without coming to Sonaviv I, I wish I could fully answer that question. I know that some of the testing that we can do, you can order it through Sonaviv, and then you would work with the doctor, and then it would be um, over the phone. But I can tell you right now, uh, June, you, or yeah, is it June? Yes, June, sorry. Um, you would really want to come down to Sanaviv. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. Um, you get to experience the food, and we have other um, technology here that I haven't even talked about. We have a whole quiet room. Uh, we have the spiritual psychology department. We have a hyperbaric chamber. We just have so much to offer here um, that it would be so worth your while to come down here. And uh, all you have to do is just give one of our admissions or sales team a call there, and the numbers are up on the screen. Uh, Sherry's asking, is this recorded for listening again? Guess what, Sherry? Yes, it is. So you just have to go onto YouTube and uh, just Google, or go on YouTube and search Sonaviv webinars, and it should come up for you. Okay, so Jav is asking, where can I get probiotics? And then she's got food, question mark, question mark, question mark. Probiotics in your food is going to come from fermented foods. So kimchi, uh, fermented cabbage, fermented uh, pickles is another one. You can also get it from a product called kombucha, which is a fermented drink. If you wanted to get probiotics, uh, you can go to our Sanaviv store. Just Google Sanaviv store and it'll come up and we have tons of different probiotics. And Jav, you might want to go uh, one step further and you might actually want to uh, get an online doctor's consultation so that we can get the right probiotic for you because there's tons of different probiotics out there and we want to make sure that we get the right strain for you. All right, Lisa Joe is saying, thank you for the excellent seminar. Can I have the PDF of the slides emailed to me? Is the seminar recorded so that I can play it again? I won't be able to get the, the slides to you, but like I said, all you have to do is go to YouTube and you will be able to get the, um, the uh, webinar from there. Uh, Mary, hi Karen, great job. Is there any way, ah, oh, this, my goodness, all you people want the slides. Woohoo, makes me feel good. I'm glad that I was able to uh, pique your interest. All right, we have uh, Linda. I recently heard a thyroid webinar, and the doctor speaking said that those with thyroid conditions should not consume fermented foods like kombucha. What do you think? Uh, you know what, Linda? I wish I would have heard that uh, webinar so that I could understand the research behind that. Um, I could understand maybe some of the fermented foods that are high in goitrogens, because there are goitrogenic foods that you want to avoid with thyroid. But I'm not sure if breaking them down would remove the goitrogen um, effects or not. So that's a really good question. If you could actually send me a link or something so that I could listen to that webinar, I would love to. Uh, it's uh, info at sanaviv.com. And let's see, Vivian, what happens and what can I do when I'm having pain due to slurry bile in the body? I already have my gallbladder removed. Thanks. Well, v Vivian, I think that you're an excellent candidate to uh, come down to Sanaviv so that we can do some of this testing on you and find out exactly what's going on. 
I mean, it's one thing to have your gallbladder removed, right? But the fact that you're still having pain and that kind of thing, it's not something that I could answer in a webinar without really getting to know you. And when you come down to Sanaviv, uh, not only do you meet with a medical doctor, but you meet with all of the other practitioners and doctors as well so that we can give you the best answer and home care product uh, for what you're asking here. Um, uh, Marisol was on, but it's in Spanish. Uh, lo siento, I know very little Spanish, so I'm sorry that I can't answer that question for you. Uh, Loretta says, I keep trying to tell dermatologists in Australia that psoriasis is diet related, but they don't accept it. How can I get a study up in Australia to convince them? Uh, Loretta, glad that you're on the ball there. What you could do is you can go to, uh, it's either google.scholar or scholar.google and just put in um, uh, psoriasis and, and diet and there will be tons of uh, research that will come up for you that, so that you can share that with your dermatologist and good luck with that. And if you're not getting anywhere, we have tons of people from Australia uh, that come here and we can definitely help you with your psoriasis. That's one of our specialties too. So Pat's asking, will this cause gout and how can you help? Uh, Pat, I'm not sure what would cause gout, but I do know that there's a strong correlation between um, elevated insulin levels and metabolic syndrome causing gout as well as some of the foods that you're eating. That's something that we could definitely help you with down here at Sanaviv. Loretta is asking, just last night academic researchers are starting to 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 starting leaky gut and depression plus supplementation would like to introduce Sanaviv and USANA. I'm not sure what you're asking there, but yes, definitely there is a role between leaky gut and depression. Uh, our gut is our second brain, and here's an interesting fact that once you have a complete breakdown of your um, your small intestines and your microvilli, once you have all those undigested foreign proteins coming into your bloodstream as well as all the bacterians and antigens and viruses, they now have are able to pass right into the blood-brain barrier and can affect parts of your brain. So definitely. Uh, Claudia asks, the best, most understandable, comprehensive treatment of digestion I've been privileged to hear. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Claudia. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, Lisa says, I was the NZ Reset 2013 winner and was fortunate to spend five days at Sanaviv. The clean, healthy food is so delicious and I felt fantastic after my stay and I lost eight pounds. I also had the Array 3 test done and highly recommend everyone um, to get this when they go to Sanaviv. Thank you very much, Lisa. And um, just on that note about the eight pounds, this is really interesting. Now, if you remember when I was showing you those uh, those pictures of the fire department coming in and that histamine response, histamine uh, causes a lot of uh, bloating or water retention in the body. So you also have this inflammatory response going on as well. So that's going to retain water in the system. So most people who come down here will lose between 5 and 12 pounds in one week. Now you're probably thinking, oh, that's just water weight, and you're absolutely right. It is water weight because what's happening is when you're eating the wrong foods, you are you're increasing that inflammatory response, but you're also increasing the histamine response. And so when we remove all of those inflammatory type foods, your histamine shuts off, and so now you can literally drain that water weight that you've put on. So yeah, way to go, Lisa. Congratulations on your um, being the winner for 2013. Uh, Florence is asking, how much Hepacil do you recommend daily? Florence, start with what's on the bottle and then um, see how that goes for you. And then Kim Parker says, I have a customer who vomits every time she takes Fibrog. She is very bloated and constipated. Kim, I would definitely recommend this person to go and see a doctor. That's not something that should be happening. Um, if you can get them in touch with somebody down here at Sanaviv, that would be wonderful. If not, please refer her to, um, to a doctor. Uh, Denise says, does the store have starter culture so I can start making my own kombucha? No, Denise, we don't have that, and uh, I I wish I could send you one of mine because I actually make my own kombucha, and I think that's awesome that you want to start making your own kombucha. You can go on to Amazon and just put in a kombucha starter. One of the ones that I've gotten is uh, from Kombucha Mama, 
and uh, they they're very professional I've never had a problem and I just that's where I got my starters from uh, let's see lots of people saying thank you I appreciate it so much that you've taken the time to put in there that you you're loving this this is awesome uh, and somebody says they would love, they're in Australia and that they would love to bring their family here one day. Well, you know what, Vasila, if you put the intention out there, guess what? It'll come sooner than you think. Um, what else? Oh, that's it. Looks like I've answered all of the questions uh, to all of you. Sarah and Val and Alan, thank you so much for, for saying thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Mary put uh, more webinars, please. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mary, if you are on our um, email list which it sounds like you are uh, we have monthly webinars and we have a whole we have a webinar actually right up until December of this year so thank you to every single one of you thank you for taking the time to be on this make sure that you uh, visit sanaviv.com our website if you're interested in any supplements, we definitely have those on our Sanaviv store. Uh, if you would love to talk to anybody in our admissions or sales department, please, in the USA, it's 801-954-7600. Uh, if you're calling from uh, other countries, it's uh, 52 is the uh, country code, and then it's 661-614-9200. And we also have a chat box on our website, which is sonaviv.com. Thank you so much, and wherever you are, I hope that you are having a wonderful, wonderful time. Talk to you soon.